Hello again, this is Courtney Britton with the Texas Wildlife Association. Welcome to today's Wildlife for Lunch. Our topic is Pronghorn in Peril, Efforts to Recover a Declining Species. And it's presented by our friend Dr. Lewis Harvison, Director of the Borderlands Research Institute and Professor of Wildlife Management at Sul Ross State University. The Wildlife for Lunch webinar series is made possible through funding by the San Antonio Livestock Exposition and is hosted by the Texas Wildlife Association and the Texas AgriLife Extension Service. And with that, Dr. Harvison, I am going to turn it over to you. Give me just one second here to get this set up. And it's all yours and your mic is live. Excellent. Thank you, Courtney, for having me and, and for hosting this. I think the Wildlife for Lunch series has been a, a big success for TWA in trying to connect many uh, constituents across Texas. So I'm very pleased to be here. Uh, today we're talking, of course, about pronghorn, and I'm sure uh, many of you as uh, TWA members have, have been keeping up with some of the dilemmas we're facing out here in West Texas with regard to our pronghorn. And, of course, uh, without you know, getting too far in, I wanted to make sure everyone was familiar with really who, who's, who's helping us out. Uh, obviously, our, our donors uh, from foundations, the safari clubs, um, in, in, a, in a big network of participants and fellow researchers from, you know, northern Washington State, uh, southeastern United States, and Georgia, and of course across Texas. And I would certainly be remiss uh, not to include our co-authors on this paper, uh, Billy Tarrant, and Sean Gray of Texas Parks and Wildlife, and then my uh, two Cracker Jack graduate students, James Weaver and Justin Hoffman. And, and so today, my presentation, I'm really going to give a little bit of background, kind of get you up to speed on, on the, the clues and information that we have to date uh, with regard to the decline, and then kind of drill into some of the, the aspects of the issues that we're, we're investigating, including the diseases, uh, barriers, predation, uh, the restoration effort that we uh, initiated and, and then the movement of those animals afterwards. And we'll kind of wrap up with kind of where we are today and where we're going for tomorrow. And, you know, most of y'all, uh, you, you stereotype a pronghorn to, uh, again, the Transpacus or maybe the Panhandle, but again, historically, the, the pronghorn occurred as far east as, as I-35 corridor, which is pretty remarkable. And, and with time and with expansion over 150, 160 years, obviously those populations have been pushed back to their stronghold of the Panhandle, uh, the Transpacus, some of the rolling plains, and even the western Edwards Plateau. You see the current distribution here in green and then the, the counties that they do occur in uh, noted in pink. Texas Parks and Wildlife, of course, is a regulatory agency responsible for monitoring uh, pronghorn and ultimately uh, for, for, for their status. Uh, they, they conduct aerial surveys each each summer, typically about this time, about May and June, and they, they basically issue permits and, and assess population levels based on those surveys. Through the years, uh, we, we know a little bit about pronghorn and where they've been uh, up until recently. Uh, the lowest population numbers we had in the state was about uh, 3,888. Uh, those numbers can grow fairly rapidly in just a couple of years, as you see in 1941. And then our all-time hope for, for the Transpacus was in 1987, where we had over 17,000 animals. That's a lot of pronghorn, and obviously we haven't seen that of late. Um, last year was our all-time low. Uh, nothing we are, are proud of, but certainly has brought some attention to the situation, and that's really where this study plays in, is, is trying to address this and try to, try to reverse these trends. The Transpacus uh, population trends, as you can see here, have declined precipitously since that time, since the 1980s. And again, we are at, at an all-time low uh, from 2011. I'm trying to work out the, the volume here, Courtney. I'm seeing some of the comments here. Is there anything I can do on my end? Let me try this. All right, how's this, everybody? I'll just keep continuing to see if I can note some of the comments on the slide. Uh, Texas Parks and Wildlife in 2008 uh, documented a significant die-off. Up to 2,500 animals died within about two or three months period in the Marshall Plateau, which historically had been one of the, the, the best habitats, not just in, in Texas, but also in southwestern United States. It has historically had some of the highest densities 
again, throughout Arizona, New Mexico, and Texas. Uh, these animals perished after roughly eight months of, of no precipitation, and we had a very unusual hard freeze in May um, following the, the Easter weekend that really set back some of the poor growth that we did. Um, they, they died basically because of that hard freeze. In 2009, uh, we did get some precipitation. Uh, we started seeing a, a fairly normal precipitation patterns return to our area. But what, what really hurts is when we don't have this spring precipitation. Um, despite these conditions, we had a, a farm crop of about 9.4%, 9 uh, which we need about somewhere between 20 and 30% really to maintain our herd levels uh, by our, by our uh, model. And the, the die-off occurred really in the orange areas uh, just to the west of Marfa. Uh, and you'll see here, it's noted in orange, we had a 9.4% farm crop in 2009. And then we had the two little blue stars that really uh, have significance. Because of the die-off, we uh, reached out to some of the, the best wildlife vets in, in the state, including Ken Waldrop and Dan McBride, and we were able to, to do a necropsy on a couple of animals. And that really kind of led us to some of the clues that we pursued. Uh, the animals were, were posted, and, and basically the, the really the distinguishing characteristics that, that we saw that was most important or most unusual was uh, homunculus levels. And we'll get into homunculus here in a little, in a little bit. But basically, it's a, a parasite and abomasum uh, that, that makes the animals immunic. And so those kind of clues really played into how we uh, directed our research in the following years. Uh, again, after 2009, with the rainfall, farm crops had dropped to 5%, so almost non-existent farm crop. Uh, last year, in particular, uh, it was even worse in this area. And so we've gone through three years at 10% at or less farm crop, which is really, really difficult to maintain those herds. And, and so our numbers, obviously, are going down every year. Uh, because of these, these situations and, and discoveries uh, with, the, with the parasites, the die-off, Obviously, this, this has economic impact. It has ecological impact. Uh, we, we started getting together in a very informal setting, and we, we finally said, you know what, let's, let's identify some players. Let's pull some people together. And we met in September 2009, which represented uh, landowners, hunters, outfitters, vets, researchers, biologists, et cetera. And, and we basically just evaluated what we knew and what we didn't know, uh, looked at literature. We did everything we could to try to identify some of the clues uh, to the situation that, that we had seen. We knew it was rainfall related, but there was a lot of things going on that was not rainfall related. And so we, we, we dubbed ourselves the Trans-Pecos Pronghorn Working Group, and we made some recommendations at that September meeting to start a, a very broad scale um, hunter harvested assessment in, in that following October. So we had a very quick turnaround. Um, this, which leads us really to one of our, our first uh, initial studies was looking at diseases and parasites in pronghorn. And so I mentioned homunculus earlier, and not necessarily the lunchtime fodder, uh, but the homunculus you see, and if you can imagine a, a, a skinny rubber band that you used to get on your newspaper, dissecting that and cutting that up in four ways, that's basically what you're looking at in, in the homunculus one. They're very they're spaghetti like, they're even thinner than spaghetti. And, and each one of these animals can take up to one-tenth of a cc of blood a day from its host. Uh, they're very common in, in ungulates, especially in the southeastern United States where there's high rainfall zones. So these habitats, wet habitats, is where we expect them. Uh, they are the number one enemy for sheep and goats. And, and we've documented them in pronghorn before, but not nearly at this level. And so it was really a, a unique discovery to find a uh, the number of worms that we found in, in the pronghorn that we posted, and so we wanted to investigate that a little bit further. Now, one tenth of a cc doesn't sound like a lot, but if you are an animal that weighs maybe 100 pounds at best, and you have 4,000 of these worms in your stomach, it's pretty significant. Um, a goat, which is kind of a, an analog to the pronghorn, is, you know, physiologically speaking, uh, you know, over about uh, 1,000 worms, that goat's probably going to die within a week. And so you, so just to kind of set the, the stage of what kind of situation we're dealing with and, and what those worms can do. They, again, they seem really benign, but they, they can make some, some big changes in, in the life and survival of those animals. Uh, with that disease investigation, we, we, we called everyone to the table. We got landowners, we got hunting guys, we got students, we got parks and wildlife biologists. We did some pretty massive trainings uh, using go to you know the analog. Showed everyone what kind of data we wanted. We wanted abomasum, we wanted liver, we wanted 
uh, tongue for genetic work, we wanted uh, fecal samples, we wanted a lot of, lot of information from harvested animals and as many harvested animals as possible. So it's really a, a pretty tremendous effort um, to implement this and, and again the participation levels from landowners and hunters was incredible. Our guys and, and the team was, was riding along with, with the hunters and uh, or, or waiting for them at the check stations or, or whatever. It's, it's really impressive what, what we were able to pull off in a short amount of time. So some results and, and you see uh, in orange is the Marathon Basin. You see a little white sliver right there in the middle of, of the orange polygon. That is Marathon. Uh, where you see the intersection of the yellow, the kind of the burgundy, the green, and the tan, that's Marfa to give you some ideas of, of uh, landmarks. Uh, and then you see the, the homunculus levels. Again, 95% of the, the animals that we harvested or the hunters harvested we looked at uh, had homunculus. So we had prevalence of 95% on average across all animals of 102 animals that we looked at. Um, we had an average about 552. And we had some animals that had none and some animals that had over 4,000. So we, we saw a lot of um, variability among the, the samples that we collected. And then you can see in the legend there, the color-coded legend, the average number of worms that we saw in each of the herd units. And again, the herd units of, that we, were, we saw the die-off, uh, you know, with Marfa Plateau, with, with the lime green, uh, the tan right south and east of, of Marfa. Uh, so everywhere around Marfa was really kind of a hot zone, as well as Marathon Basin. The Marathon Basin populations have, have really been poorly in the last five or ten years. Um, and, and so we saw a real high incidence or prevalence uh, of worms in Marathon. Uh, what we didn't see is, is culverts and hub steps seem to be somewhat separated. They had them, but not nearly at the levels that we saw in the southern part of the trans Basin. Move on to 2010. Uh, sub subsequent samples, again, not as many permits going out, so a little bit more difficult to get samples from hunters because there's just not as many pronghorn being harvested. Uh, we were able to get 95 animals, uh, again, look at their worm content, again, 96% roughly about the same. Uh, average had gone down, which was, which was a good sign, but also we were also losing animals at the same time. Um, you see here, you know, the, the hot spots really Again, the, the Marathon Basin, coming around the Marfa Plateau. Then we move on to 2011. Again, almost very, very few permits issued. Uh, we had 41 samples, and again, high prevalence. Um, we had a, a lot, probably a lot more variability in these samples because we had fewer animals, and so it didn't kind of uh, level out. But then we started seeing the worm loads a little bit higher in Hudspeth and Culberson County. You kind of look at this across the years for the, the herd units that we were looking at, you know, it's kind of all over the place. We did see a, a peak really in 2009 for most of the Marfa area, uh, with one exception. Uh, American Basin about the same as in Hutspitz, we started seeing a little bit of increase. And so what, what this means for us is, is what's the net effect? Obviously we, we have a, a parasite host situation going on, but what does it mean to the animal? Well, we, we were seeing animals die. Uh, we believe that the die-off that we saw was obviously drought to related, but also the worms basically just another uh, factor that's pushing these animals over the edge. And then the other is, do, do the worm loads actually affect pawn crops? So we see the correlation here in the relationship. My, my answer is it's not cause and effect, but we, it obviously is affecting pawns at, at some level. And we see a decline as, as worm loads go up, we see lower uh, pawn production out of our transpacious pawn workers. Now, one of the problems, in, in especially in 2011, as we started um, getting data from our animals, um, is that we were dependent on harvested animals. And so that, that's really a difficult thing to, to do this type of field work. And so we wanted to figure out a way, is there a non-invasive way to assess worm loads without obviously having to harvest them or, or get harvested samples? And so we found a correlation between the fecal egg count and the worm load, which is which really plays in important as we start restocking these animals and evaluating um, some of the management opportunities, uh, whether it's worming or habitat management or whatever. We're able to monitor uh, worm loads and as we as we do these different treatments. Again, some of the other uh, uh, findings we have with regard to homunculus. Uh, it is not, you know, it's not from livestock. We, we did send some samples off to uh, several labs, and, and we have two situations that, that may be going on. One is we have a new strain 
of homunculus, or we have a, a new species altogether that, that has not been discovered. Either way, it's still a blood sucking worm, and we don't want them. Um, low nutrition, obviously, in, in any sort of parasite situation, you can you can help the nutritional plane of an animal and it's how it deals with parasites if it's on a higher nutritional plane. So in, in times of drought when there's few, you know few uh, forbs out there for them, things like that, that makes it much more difficult. Plus we have some good evidence that in dry times animals are actually concentrated a little bit more in some of these lower lying habitats um, that that it may concentrate those animals and actually help actually progresses uh, their their advancement to the population a little bit faster. Moving on to habitat fragmentation, genetics, and other aspects of the study that we're, we're looking at. Again, you saw the distribution, how that has changed significantly. You see what's coming, you know, from the east. You guys uh, across San Antonio, Austin, Dallas, etc. You already experienced in this. It can have detrimental impacts as we start getting the pronghorn habitat and, and further west. Um, and typically, when you think of West Texas, fragmentation isn't something you, you, you picture. You see large mountain beasts, et cetera, but there are some situations, especially uh, net wire fencing for pronghorn, uh, the railroad system, the highways, et cetera, and we've learned from Western states that these, these are formidable barriers for pronghorn. And pronghorn, historically, you know, evolutionary-wise, they were not necessarily migratory down here, but they were certainly nomadic. They would follow the rain. They would, if they smelt rain, they would go to that area and wait for those horses to come around. So they, they moved a lot. They, they have a, a need and desire to run, and they certainly have the desire to roam. And as we have put over, you know, the 100, last 100 years, fences and roads and everything else, that obviously has limited. So we had some theories, or we had some hypotheses that we wanted to investigate with regard to herd units. Uh, Texas Parks and Wildlife Code units that have been established since the 70s were really based on landmarks like we talked about, uh, railroads, highways, and fences. And so the question is, as those animals are, are they truly isolated uh, from other populations? Is there inbreeding? Uh, can that uh, influence reduce fitness? All these things we wanted to investigate. And so we, we set out on a study, had some hypotheses based on these potential barriers, and then hired a Renee Kelleher uh, to help collect these samples. Again, using uh, hunters, uh, Texas Parks and Wildlife, getting as many samples as we can uh, throughout uh, the Transpacific for two years and then the Panhandle for one year. Uh, we obtained 351 samples, which represented about 20% of the bucks harvested, so a really good sample size. And we found, uh, actually contrary to our predictions, there was a lot of, lot of uh, diversity within the genetics of pronghorn, which was really good news. Uh, one of the things that we did is we added the, the panhandle to our analysis, uh, which really was serendipitous as we started to get in a more crisis situation, and we revealed that the Transpacus and the panhandle were actually very similar, um, had very similar genetic makeup, which was very, very good for us. Um, possibilities for that, why they, they may be similar, is, is one is, as you'll see later, is, is we, we translocated 6,000 animals uh, since the 1930s back and forth between the Transpacus and the Canyon. It's been a shell game that we've been playing uh, for years to maintain populations in, in both of those ecoregions. Uh, the second is that maybe the natural movements that do occur uh, is adequate. Uh, many times it's just one individual over a generation should be, should be fine. But then also dispersal. We know in ungulates, um, young males in particular, um, have a propensity to, to leave their natal range and, and set up. And so that, that exchange of genetic material through dispersal may be helping also. And one, one observation we did see is we did see some differentiation between the Culberson and Hudspeth County area in yellow. This area is, is well noted in Texas and Texas Big Game Awards as some of the, uh, the best Boone Crockett uh, habitat for Texas for pronghorn in the state. Uh, and so it's, it's, you know, it's very interesting that we see the differentiation. But also that I-10, if you look at you know, any of our roads in most of West Texas, you know, they're two-lane highways, et cetera. They're not that bad. But when you talk about I-10, you talk about the traffic from El Paso to the middle of Odessa, that is a formidable area. That, that is a divided highway, two lanes on each side, fences, et cetera. That, that is very formidable, and that probably lends itself to the differentiation that we found. Moving on to some of our uh, predation work, looking at fawns in particular. Uh, again, the, the lack of recruitment um, into the population of, of the pond cohort uh, led us to believe that predation is, is maybe a factor in, in the, the pond decline. 
And again, uh, if you look at precipitation uh, noted in the, in the line and the bar graph noted in the orange bars, uh, that's fonts per dome. So you're looking at you know 10%, 20% on the right axis, and then the index on the right. The higher up is wetter, the lower is, is drier. A, a really, really tight correlation, in particular spring. Spring precipitation really is the best indicator for what kind of fawn crop we're going to have. And so we know that, that fawns and rainfall are tied very, very closely together. But again, some of the things that we've been seeing, we've seen decent rainfall, but we haven't seen the fawns recruiting. So that, that's what we were trying to figure out. So we went out, to, we, we, we captured, we radio collar, we took small radios, we get some data on age, weight, sex, things like that, and then we monitor. We, we want to know, you know, are they being abandoned? Um, are they dying of, of malnutrition, uh, the predation, etc.? See some pictures here of the crew. Uh, these, these are just from this year. We just, we're still actually uh, monitoring fawns from this year. And, and so it's a big effort to get out there. We notice the uh, shining lights like you would spotlight in beer. And then we basically circle the animal, put a hoop net over them. Uh, we handle them less than about three minutes and then release them and, and they, they, they do fine. Uh, we do monitor almost daily, and, and so there's a lot of effort out there monitoring these animals because uh, they're so small, you know, a lot of times uh, the predators can eat almost a whole carcass, and so it's really difficult to, to find uh, the, the right clues to determine what kind of predator is involved. Uh, looking at age weight data uh, for the transpacus from last year, I'm going to flip here real quick. Um, and I haven't standardized these at this time uh, with regard to the age, but some general trends we saw last year. Again, last year, the worst drought we've seen uh, in, in 100 years or so, um, but the body weights were, were just really remarkable. In fact, we were getting such low body weight, we were wondering if our scales were wrong, but in fact, our scales were, were dead on, but we were seeing animals that were twice as old, um, maybe on American Basin, weighed half as less. Uh, than something out of Hudson County. So we, we documented some ridiculously low body weight, and they were basically walking skeletons. They had no chance, uh, either, you know, the mother was already malnourished, and, and so she produced malnourished fawns also, and, and they, were, they were basically walking dead. Um, looking at the types of mortality we saw in 2001, we caught 26 fawns. Uh, 24 of those died within the first uh, five months, so we had very high predation. Again, these animals were already um, malnourished, and so their ability to evade predators, etc., is, is obviously going to be compromised. Uh, 2012, we just got the data in yesterday. Uh, looking at similar trends, we did catch 34, even though we had you know, fewer animals on the ground. Uh, we, have, we have 26 mortalities to date. Uh, we, you know, so again, coyotes, we always knew coyotes were tough on, on crawling pond. That, that's all over, you know, the western United States. Bobcats was something we, we really didn't anticipate, and they're very effective predators. You see a lot of predators, they know when those ponds are dropping, and they watch the does, and they, they watch to where they may go and, and, and nurse that, that pond, and then they work on those ponds. Um, eagles, fox, uh, we did have documents from abandonment. And then some unknowns. Again, not getting to the carcass fast enough is just very difficult to do when you talk about a you know, six-pound animal. Working on to the, the translocations, again, uh, 2011, last year, we had one of the largest translocations we've had in, in some 40 or 50 years. And again, as I mentioned earlier, translocations has, has been an integral part of pronghorn management for Texas Parks and Wildlife since the 30s. Uh, you see some of these uh, great historic photos uh, using corral traps, uh, putting them in trailers, and again, we've moved animals all over. Uh, the Rocker Bee and, and really the Hill Country and the Pony Basin area has been a source stock for a lot of the pronghorn, uh, both in the Panhandle and the Transpacus, but we've also moved animals from the Transpacus to the Panhandle and vice versa. So, so there's been a lot of shuffling. Uh, you see here by the decade, uh, we didn't have a lot in, in the 2000s and in the 1960s, but you see, you know, over 3,000 animals in the 1940s and over 1,000 in the 1970s. So it's been a, a really important tool uh, for maintaining pronghorn herds that are working translocation. Uh, one of the issues with translocation is, is the monitoring. Obviously, in the, in the 40s, 50s, 60s, even into the 70s, you know, to date the success of, of individuals that were translocated, we really didn't have instruments. We didn't have telemetry. We didn't have GPS collars. And so the fate of those animals really wasn't well documented. It was just, let's throw them out there and let's hope for the best. 
Um, there was a study by Del Monte and Kaufman that kind of went back and dug through the old files. And again, of the ones that they looked at, you know, very few of those were successful. Some of those the reasons for failure and some of the reasons uh, for, for you know, lack of success in our recent one is drought. And that's something that, that cannot be predicted. Um, but obviously, range conditions, et cetera, leading to that point, you don't know after you unload those animals what's coming around the corner, what mother nature is going to throw at you. Uh, fencing issues, uh, coyote predation we talked about. And then, uh, you know, there's kind of a uh, economy of scale with regard to the number of animals per translocation. Fewer isn't as good, more is better. So the recent translocation, again, just some, some pictures of that. Uh, we had several objectives. One, of course, was to to start supplementing the declining population that we had in the trans -Pacific. We needed to do something and we needed to do it quick. We still didn't understand all the mechanics and intricacies of the decline, but we were at the point where we, you know, we had landowners that used to get 40 or 50 permits and they only had three or four pronghorn on the, on the land. So we had to do something very quick. The other is that at the time the panhandle, uh, some of the landowners were, were complaining about growing pronghorn populations and so they had surpluses. I actually had some uh, depredation issues with regard to wheat fields and crops and things like that. So they were wanting to harvest more animals. And so it was just very, very timely that we had the situations on both the extremes. Uh, we wanted to monitor and evaluate the success. Again, we haven't done this in the last 30 or 40 years. So understanding what is a good translocation and what is not. We really wanted to understand how those animals move through the pasture and, and how the homunculus interactions really play in to animals that were relatively clean. And, and one of the, the quotes that, that came out when we were doing the translocation was that deer bounce and pronghorn break. They are an extremely sensitive species. Um, they're very difficult. They're obviously very fast, the fastest land mammal in, in North America. Um, they're, they're just a really sensitive species. It's not just going out there with a net gun and an R-22 and, and catching pronghorn. It takes a lot of work. You've got to slow them down. You've got to use the target to your advantage. There's a lot of things. And so we, we hired um, the best um, helicopter service that money could buy to do this study and we, we worked very hard with the landowners in the Panhandle. They have been extremely uh, gracious and allowing us out there and, and working with them to help kind of curtail some of their uh, overpopulation issues and this is just a picture of around Galhart where most of the, the stock came from. You see some numbers 37, 40, 24. So we basically targeted about 200 animals from the Panhandle to move down to the trans -Pacific. Uh, animals were met gunned again from helicopter uh, processed. Uh, we, we got our timing down. It took us about five minutes from the time the animal was put on the ground to put in the trailer. Uh, we had four volunteer vets. We had a crew of about 40 people. Uh, we became extremely efficient in processing the animals. Uh, we were getting samples, uh, hair samples, fecal samples, taking blood getting the sedatives, the radios on them, so there was a lot going on with regard to how these animals handled and, and what we needed to do and get data from them before we put them in the trail. Uh, they were transported uh, 500 miles to the trans in, in relatively cool uh, temperature. We did this in February to maximize the coolness because pronghorn are, are susceptible to overheating. And then they were released uh, just outside of Marfa. You see the numbers in red and, and the ranches involved. Again, uh, 200 made the trip. I think 196 actually were released, so those are uh, outstanding numbers. Obviously, we don't want any mortalities, but, but it is certainly a uh, part of uh, moving any animals is, is you can have some, some issues with that. And you see heavy on the females. Uh, you know, it doesn't take but one, one buck to, to run a herd of 10 to 15 does. And so, you know, we didn't want to take um, bucks out of the, the population in, in the panhandle, which may provide income, and we were in restoration mode, so we were trying to maximize productivity of the population uh, in the trans uh, We did monitor these animals uh, very intensively, uh, ground telemetry. We had a crew of about uh, six or seven guys, uh, you know, running through the, the, the plains there and keeping up with the animals. We flew uh, every other week. Uh, we have 52 collars of the, of the 200 animals. 52 had radio cars and 28, an additional 28 had GPS cars, which took a location every hour, which is a tremendous amount of data. Uh, looking at mortality, so we, we had, um, you see a, a lot of mortalities. We don't know how they died, and again, just getting to the carcass fast enough. Um, car collisions, predation, uh, homunculus certainly played into that. Um, some capture myopathy, et cetera. We had only uh, about 20 to 25 percent of the animals that were moved survived, and that, that is abysmal. 
Um, obviously, everyone on the team and project and everybody involved were hoping for something better, and, and certainly if we had rains, we, we most likely would have had better. Uh, but we did learn a lot from, from this process, and as you see, the mortalities through time, you know, there's a lot of mortality on, on the front end of this. And, and again, from roughly October till about June, we had no measurable precipitation. Um, we, we did have some, some rain, I think, actually in November. And so everything that we did, you know, we were banking on the rain that, that typically comes. Once we started seeing the rain come in, in about June, July, uh, those mortalities uh, diminished to almost nothing. And so again, that, that rain, you know, we just, it was just bad time. We, we built a very difficult hand. We had a big freeze um, in January, you know, sub-zero temperatures for about four days. So even, anything that was green, you know, died at that time anyway, and then the drought. So it was just a really, really difficult time for, for all wildlife. Uh, some of the things we did learn with regard to, to the, the transplants, the animals that were younger fared better, um, and, and some literature supports that too, but that's going to help us as we target our next uh, restoration effort is to target younger animals uh, to bring down. They just travel better, they, they adapt better to new environments. Our trapping mortality, actually trapping on the, you know, with net capture, very low. Um, again, the, the helicopter operations uh, uh, is typically how people do it. The crowd trapping is kind of a, um, a technique that has, has gone out with style. It's just it's, it's a lot more labor intensive. There's actually higher mortality. Most studies will, will support that. Um, and so we, we, we are trying to learn from, from these, um, this process. Again, the young animals we talked about. Um, and again, the numbers. And so one thing that we're looking in the future is looking at kind of a super stocking approach. Um, you know, we moved animals. All these animals were within about a 10 mile radius that we released on the Marshall Plateau. So they, they really were basically in the same area. And they mixed up. I mean, very quickly we, we ear tagged them differently so we could keep track of, of how they did mix up even though they were not radio. Uh, of course, minimizing handling times. Our, our goal was always about three and a half minutes. We did that about 90% of the time. Monitor body temperatures because of their propensity to have uh, to overheat. Uh, larger trailers did better than, than smaller trailers. They just seemed more, you know, comfortable in those areas. Uh, and then coyotes. Again, coyotes, you know, in a drought, uh, we've lost almost all our rodents, all our rabbits on, on the market plateau. Um, you know, we were we were feeding the coyote population. So the landowners on their part. Um, obviously they're doing some coyote control, but there, there may be some more that, that can be done to give them the best chance we can. Now moving on to some of the, the data with regards to movements of the animals after they're released. Again, this is really one of the aspects that really hasn't been studied with regards to restoring pronghorn is, is what do they do when they're released? What, how far do they move? Um, you know, do they stay in a group? Or one group size better than others? All these kind of things we wanted to address. And then move repairs. And, and you see here, these are actually data off of a couple of radio cars that we collected. And you see the one on the left, um, if I get this line to work, this line here is, is basically Highway 90. And so Highway 90 um, cuts up from, from Marfa up to Valentine, and that's Valentine actually on the upper left end there. That is a barrier. I mean, those, that, that animal in particular could not cross when it wanted to. And so those, those are the things that we've got to work out. We obviously don't want to road fill and, and collisions on the highway, but we, somehow we need to mitigate uh, the animals and their ability or desire to cross the fence. Even on this other side, you see uh, this, this fence, at least right here, tend to be a, a formidable barrier. You see them, so it doesn't take long to look at this type of data to see that they actually had, had some issues. And that has really helped us as we start uh, working with NRCS and, and landowners and trying to identify what truly is a wildlife friendly fence and what is not. Obviously, net water is not a wildlife friendly fence. And so that, those are just some of the things that we're getting from, from this type of data to help us as we prepare for future release sites and try to piece the Marshall Plateau back together so that pronghorn can travel as they, as they desire. If we look at the animals and, and start breaking this up, it's how they how they move immediately. Obviously, there's kind of a shock factor moving to a new habitat, um, and so they 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 move uh, you know distance from release site. They they move gradually up in, in their exploring. Uh, they have to pioneer and determine 
And I've got to figure out where those sink gaps are, where the waters are. All these areas have a ton of water, so water is usually not an issue. Uh, the sink is, uh, and again, during drought, where is the food? What, what, are we, what are we supposed to eat? The brush here, what are we eating? And so we see basically the tendency of animals to move uh, further and further away with time. Eventually that, that settles down. Um, after about a month, a month and a half, those animals basically have found their group. Uh, they're, they're, they're kind of reassessing their social structure. Um, you know, the herd that they were caught with isn't necessarily uh, what, what they're going to balance out to be. And so they're going through a lot of, lot of things to try to figure out where, where that new home is going to be. And so you see the, the home range size is, you know, rise anywhere from about 25, um, it's actually 25, uh, 2,500 acres uh, down, all the way down to the breeding season and kind of stabilize. And then we see kind of a peak, and that, that actually is represented mainly by bucks uh, around the rock. Again, looking at habitat utilization, this is one of the aspects that we're just now getting into. Um, one of the theories I mentioned earlier is with regard to the homuncus. You know, the parasite is actually picked up. Well, it's in their gut. Let's start there. Um, it's it shed through uh, defecation, and then the worms are basically in the, in the feces. Uh, with moisture, uh, those worms are hatched, they go through the larval stage, uh, they basically get on the vegetation, and then they're digested. So they're digested at a, at a, at a larval stage, and then they grow and, and maximize, and they go through that same cycle in the abomasum. If we can understand where those worms are more likely to be, uh, than others of where pronghorn is more likely to, to pick them up, that is something that we can start managing for. And so we, we again, we're just diving into this uh, just recently, but what we saw is, is and you see in these graphics, this, this brown area here, um, you know, we, we, these are really low depressions uh, in, the, in roughly a very flat terrain, and they're just little swales, what I call them. And so there, there may be a foot, maybe a foot and a half, maybe only four inches different uh, from the upland side from yellow or green, but those are the areas where if there's any water runoff or a deeper soil, that's really where your forbs are going to start growing. If there's any sort of dew or anything like that, that's where your concentration of forbs is going to be during dry times, even wet times. But as it becomes more wet, that, that food resource is better distributed across the landscape. But in a drought, they're really restricted to these lower areas. And then that's what we saw basically the problem do. They spent a lot of time in those soils. Well, our theory right now is that because they're concentrated and they're defecating basically in the same habitat, they're basically accelerating that whole worm cycle pretty, pretty quickly. And they're concentrating all this in, into the one little habitat. And so some, some of the patterns of beyond the habitat utilization that, that we saw is we saw dispersal anywhere from three to, six, three to 10 miles immediately. And so as we start looking at release sites, uh, what kind of barriers may be there, you know, these are numbers that we'll be trying to assess what kind of radius we need to be working at. Uh, another tendency that we, we saw in the literature after the fact was the affinity for the animals to move northward and, and north and east. They're basically moving towards where we brought them from. And, and if we brought them from New Mexico, they would probably tend towards that direction. And so that's something that we can actually, um, you know, make a compromise if we want them to establish them on a habitat we just need to compensate a little bit and, and hopefully they, they will establish what we want them to. Um, they did show an affinity within the first month. Home range sizes after everything washed out was about 9,500 acres. This is actually quite a bit larger than, than what has been reported. This may be a drought factor, this may be a, a restored animal factor. Um, and then the preference. Uh, again, because of the, the, the lack of resources uh, in Forbes primarily, um, they really chose disturbed areas, and so, you know, tumbleweed, things like that, they either went after those, anything green on, on the ground at that time, and then the soils that we talked about a moment ago. And then obviously the fences. The fences really were, were a pretty tremendous uh, observation for us, because as, as we started uh, with this process, we, we had some ideas of what, what is a good fence, what is a bad fence, and that has changed. Uh, obviously the net wire is, is a bad fence. Um, but even some of the, the standard barbed wire fences needed some adaptation, and, and, and we may tweak that as we move forward with uh, some of our, our partners. So what does this all mean uh, for pronghorn prong and, and the transpacus? 
Well, we have a hypothesis, and, and this is this is kind of what we're thinking right now. Obviously, in drought, uh, there's going to be low flow production, and, and I didn't really get into it, but basically, pronghorn or concentrate selectors, they choose uh, the plants that have the greatest nutrition on the landscape. And so, as you see, pronghorn work through habitat. They're looking for forbs. Their, their diet is 10% or less grasses. And even though they're grassland species, grass isn't all that important other than cover. Uh, so they're looking for forbs and, and, and a little bit of browse. They become fall and winter, they, they go to browse just like our deer do. Uh, but without those forbs, you get malnourishment. Uh, and that, that's going to affect the does. And as that affects the does, it's going to affect, obviously, reproduction recruitment. Now, there's several scenarios here. There's one that the animal that's really bad, you know, there's, there's reabsorption that takes place. This probably doesn't go on a lot in, in most years. We're guessing last year with the drought, it probably occurred more than, than we thought. Um, pronghorn, life history-wise, about 95% of them have twins every time. So they are extremely productive animals. But in, in poor years, you know, we, we had a lot of singlets out there, and we don't think that predation played into that. We think that they actually reabsorbed one fetus or maybe two, or et cetera. So we had malnourished fawns take the ground. And then the other is silver. Basically, the animal was born dead, or, and, and we documented this, the, the fetus or the, the, the neonate is abandoned. And so these, these are options that dam, that, 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 that mother has to weigh in. Um, and a lot of it is inherent as soon as they don't make a decision, but you know, they're in survival mode. When you have no food and or very little food out there, you know, you, you're not in production, you're into maintenance. And, and that's what we saw in this situation. So that, that's going to affect the, the farm recruitment. Well, what does that do with us? You know, you're talking about drought. How do we how do we mitigate drought? Well, not not to mention drought, but we have other factors. Obviously, the, the, the parasites, the disease issues that we've documented in these populations certainly did help. Uh, malnourished doe is going to be much more susceptible to the issues of disease and and, and parasites, uh, and certainly so with predation. A malnourished animal has you know 3,000 worms in it is not going to evade a coyote like one that is clean. So those, those are serious issues. And then the barriers, their ability to go and find better habitat or to evade predators. We know that coyotes will pin up uh, pronghorn and corner fences on net water. So there's, there's a lot of other issues that play into this, um, kind of the side factors and disease predation barriers that are some of those. But from a management sense, you know, there's several things we can do. Amazing, obviously. Uh, you know, somehow try to try to manage for forbs if we can. Um, you know, if, that, if that's reducing uh, stocking rates or whatever that may be, looking for some sort of disturbance. The prairie, the pronghorn, and fire, uh, you know, co-evolve. And so fire has to be brought back in. We're not sure what role it plays right now, but that's some of the things that we're going to be looking at. Obviously, fences. We need to work on fences. Uh, the water, the, the data I'm not sharing with you today is on the mark for plateau. There's more water than there's ever been, and water is not a limiting factor for pronghorn with regard to drinking water. Obviously, with its, its, uh, the forage is, is an issue. And then predators. Predators are always going to be there, but in restoration mode, there's very little tolerance. And we're down to almost nothing, um, and, and we have a high predation. The, the grasslands right now in the market plateau in particular are sick. Again, we have very few rodents, we have very few rabbits, and there is nothing else for those for the bobcats and coyotes and everything else that live there to eat. And so pronghorn are pretty pretty tasty snacks. So what's next? Uh, obviously we wait. Uh, we, we have started receiving rains as early as winter. We've had a great spring rain uh, for here. Our pronghorn herds are doing better. We have body weights that were almost double of what they were last year on the same age animal. And so that is a great indicator that we're going to have a good fawn crop. Uh, Parks and Wildlife has, been, has finished their the pronghorn surveys, uh, but the data hasn't been filtered yet and, and you know, released. Uh, but they're, they're guesstimating about 20, 30 percent fawn crop for the transpacers, which is great. But again, we're starting at, at a really low level already, so it's going to take some time before we get back up. Um, while we do wait, you know, we have some work to do on fences. This young man right here, alone some fence, trying to make that more pronghorn friendly. Uh, keep those waters going. I know there's been a lot of destocking in the transpacers lately, but we've got to keep those waters going. Uh, the cows are not the only ones uh, drinking on the water. And then once, once the drought does break, and let's hope it's this year, we need to proceed with translocations. We were actually scheduled to move another 200, 300 animals this past uh, February and January. 
and we put the brakes on. There was no way, and I had no doubt that was the right thing to do because it was it was as bad as it's ever been out here. And then the idea of super stocking. Um, it's a number game when you translocate and try to restore animals, and you've got to put those those animals and, and put the odds in their favor. And they are a gregarious herding animals, so the more animals, the better off they're going to be. Uh, with regard to research, obviously we're going to we're going to start looking at some direct management uh, applications. Uh, looking at some worming scenarios of worming, you know, we, we did document that clean animals or relatively clean animals do get infected with, with parasites pretty quick. Uh, within three or four months, they're back at where the, where the resident animals were. Uh, nutritional quality forage, obviously the drought's going to claim to that, but we need to get a better assessment of that. Looking at other disturbances, working with fire, working with habitat disturbances, to try to maximize. We're actually the, the market grass, uh, grasslands look great. It's probably the most conservative grazing it's had in, in the last, and not because of the drought, but in the last 25 years. And, and that may not lend itself to good pronghorn habitat because if it's all grass, it doesn't leave much for that pronghorn to eat. Uh, one thing that we neglected to address in our initial studies was the movement of the residents. We have some really good information on fences and barriers and things like that. And, and we have the same type of die-off in our translocated animals are residents, but the question is, is how do those residents navigate through the landscape compared to our, our translocated animals? And then, of course, we're going to continue to monitor um, lots of rival disease and these herds. So right now, we're, we're focusing on the three Ps, patience, precipitation, and persistence. And, um, you know, we're, we're Everyone in this project, from the Trans-Pacific Pongwon Working Group to Parks and Wildlife to our researchers and, and the landowners, no doubt, we are, we are committed to this, and it's something that, that we're going to see through. And it's going to take, you know, half a decade of restoration, I think, to, to get us back up to snow. Uh, luckily, the, the Panhandle populations have done well uh, this year, and, and we're hoping for a surplus, and so we're going to start laying the groundwork for uh, making those connections and seeing if we can uh, do some of those animals. And Courtney, I'm, I'm going to leave this last slide up here and, and let you uh, dive in at this point. Uh, contact information. We do have a, a written report. If somebody would like to contact me, I can throw a, a nice glossary of report in the mail to them. And of course, any questions that we're not able to address today, uh, certainly uh, email those to me directly. Excellent. Thank you so much, Dr. Harvison. Great presentation. Um, we do have a couple of questions. Um, Barbara has asked, are you still allowing hunting in this area? You know, the, the Parks and Wildlife uh, controls the uh, permit issue that's based on uh, the animals that, that are available. And it has to do with the uh, bucks that are available, not the does per se. And right now, based on everything that's going on, uh, even in the very last year, there were so few animals harvested, it was, I mean, it was, it was sad. Um, this year, my guess is, if they do, if they do issue permits, uh, you'll see the same thing. You'll see maybe half a dozen animals harvested, bucks only, in the region or in the Harper Plateau. But my gut says that they're, they're going to shut down harvest for first year Presidio and Jeff Davis County. Okay. Um, our next question um, is from Zelina, and she asks, how does the mortality rate for the translocated animals compare to the natural population? Were just as many animals dying in their native habitat as those who were moved? Um, this question came up when you were showing a slide that um, showed that about 20 to only 20 to 25 percent survived the translocation process. Yes, um, that, that's a great question, and that's one of the again I think one of the flaws we had is, is not being able to address the resident herds and how they dealt with the drought. Of course, we didn't see a drought coming, so we didn't, we didn't obviously plan for that. Uh, but that is something we want to address based on our observations. And when there's so few pronghorn on a, in a pasture or on a ranch, you know your pronghorn pretty well. And we, we lost a lot of residents, um, similar to what we documented in 2008. We believe the residents were dying, probably not at a faster rate, but we lost probably hundreds, if not thousands, of, of resident pronghorn at the same time we were losing our translocated animals. Uh, as, as a, if, for instance, mule deer herds in Transpacus have declined by 50%, so we lost half of our mule deer during this drought also over the last two years. So all wildlife populations in Transpacus right now have been uh, declining. Okay, and Renee asks, have the worms been linked to any of the translocations or any of the other wildlife from their scat? 
No, we, we have uh, we've looked at Audad. Uh, we were really hoping to pin everything on Audad, and that's a joke. Um, but you know, Audad are, are relatively clean. Mule deer are relatively clean. Um, the, the, the Panhandle pronghorn, you know, again, they had about 80 percent uh, prevalence. But after a period of time, you know, looking at their fecal samples after three months or six months, uh, they, they had the same worm loads as the residents that we were documenting earlier. So the animals are coming clean, but they're getting infected here locally. And so again, these, these worms have been here probably for, for centuries, but just haven't been documented like we've been able to discover them uh, of late. And so, you know, that, that relationship, the, the evolution of the worm and the pronghorn and other desert dwelling animals, that's going to be that's going to remain unknown until we we understand really the genetic structure and the lineage of this worm relative to the other worms that are popular throughout the North America. Okay, and our next question is, how do you get involved with the pronghorn group? Uh, the pronghorn group, um, it, it's been a, a pretty organic process, uh, free flowing. Um, we we bring in experts from the field. Um, as we see gaps in data. And so it, it, it's really a very, very informal group. Um, we, we do not have published meetings, but we don't have closed meetings either. Uh, we, we've invited landowners and, and, and citizens from the region uh, to be involved at whatever level they're willing to. So it's, it's kind of a difficult question. It's not like an agency-based or organization-based um, effort. It's, it's just kind of this really organic, free-flowing, uh, group that has gotten together and, and has, has been probably the most uh, rewarding um, group that I've been associated with that, that has focused on these kind of issues. Okay. Um, and folks, if you've got any more questions, please go ahead and type them into that chat window. Um, that, that answers all the questions thus far. Um, while we wait, just to make sure there are no more other questions, I do want to let everyone know that um, coming up um, August 2nd through 3rd, um, TWA and Dr. Harvison and the uh, Borderlands Research Institute and some other groups are going to be hosting the Trans-Pecos Wildlife Conference. Um, there's a link now up on our chat window um, where you can access more information through the TWA website. Um, but we encourage anyone to, uh, to please go ahead and check out that info and register. And we'd love to see you all at the wildlife conference. It's open to everyone. Um, let's see, our next question is, any chance of treating pronghorn water sources with a, oh no, Chuck, you did it to me. I'm um, inside. <laughs> uh, really good question. That's probably the most common question as we start talking about parasites is, well, let's worm them. Well, one of the issues that, that really the, the sheep and goat industry has had with, with parasites is really the overuse of worms. And so we're, we're really uh, um, cautioning landowners not to go down that road at that time. One, it's, it's not labeled appropriately, so, you know, there's some issues there. But also, if, you know, the super worms that we're seeing in the hill country, the sheep and goat, we don't want that. This, this worm is super enough. We don't make them want, want to make them ultra super. Um, as we start experimenting with, with uh, relocated animals and, and worming, we will better evaluate uh, the long-term effects of worming. Um, as you know, with, with any sort of livestock, worming isn't just a one-time deal. It's, it's something you have to do every season or every year or whatever. So it's, it's probably not cost prohibitive, and certainly on, on free-ranging native or resident pronghorn, it's, it's impossible. Um, so, but we are looking at that, looking at the habitat, looking at the water, um, looking at, uh, as we restock, what we might be able to do to curtail um, the issues with, with worms, using worm of some type. Okay. Do they prefer one forb over another? Uh, they are they are generalists with regard to forbs. Uh, they they will spend a lot of time basically anything that'll flower, um, you know, purple, yellow, anything like that. They they really like. So they're after high protein, high energy, and um, you know, right now it's a very time in Transpecos because we got rains, we got over mentioned alpine yesterday, um, and, and again everything is is working its way back, but we've been in such a deficit for the last 18 months, it's going to take some time. But the forbs are on the landscape, more forbs than we've seen in, in years, so we're, we're optimistic. Alrighty, it looks like that is our, our last question thus far. 
Um, I just want to remind folks that our next uh, Wildlife for Lunch webinar will be held August 16th, and we're going to be discussing rainwater harvesting with Billy Nippon. Um, and you can also view any of the um, previously recorded archived versions of the Wildlife for Lunch webinar series on the TWA website. I posted a link there for that as well. Um, and we usually have the recorded versions up um, within about a week or so of the live event. Um, if there aren't any other questions, I don't see any more coming through right now. Um, it looks like that will probably do it for us. Dr. Harvison, on behalf of TWA and AgriLife Extension, thank you so much for your presentation. We really appreciate your time, and, um, and we just it was a wonderful job. Thank you so much. Thank you, Corby, for having me. And thanks to all of you all for participating in the Wildlife for Lunch webinar, and we hope to see you here next time on August 16th.